cuenta. When you go to pay, how much? Uh, well, how, how much? much? How much? We step out on the tarmac and this helicopter's sitting there and this is the beginning of the week-long adventure. We're gonna take this helicopter from Guatemala City out to the coast of this top of to Pacific Fins. I've done this trip before on fixed wing, but this is something totally different. Stepping up into the helicopter, you put your seatbelt on, you get your headsets on, the blades fire up and that thing starts to rumble and it, and it all comes to life. Guatemala. We're on the Pacific coast, is Tapa, Pacific Fins, located Central America, below Mexico, next to Belize, next to Honduras. We're sitting right here on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, known for its incredible bill fishing, great mahi, great uh, tuna fishing. This is the destination, a premier billfish destination. It, this was a trip I dreamed of as a child in, in growing up. You know, if you would have asked me, 15 years ago, if I would have been here, I would have laughed at you and said, no way. But it's, it's, it's what I always dreamed of, a remote destination, the travel, the experience, the fishing. There's so many aspects of it that you can only hope to, to be a part of in your life. And I'm here, now I'm here, I'm, and I'm, I'm in it, you know? And it's incredible, it's an cr incredible, incredible time. Pacific Fins is a top-notch fishing destination, we are a top fishery within the region, and you will enjoy being able to catch so many shellfish every day. This is the perfect boat for this type of fishing. They're running small expresses or small sport fishers. And for a day where you typically have, you know, three to four anglers, a crew of three, it's a perfect boat um, to do what we're doing. We're running a spread of teasers, trolling dead bait, and th these boats are, are perfect for this area. Well, same, same. We got the same one, babe. We got the same fish. I'm gonna let you handle it for right now. How do we have the same fish? He ate two baits. Woo! That's a nice dolphin. Oh, nice mahi. That fresh. Uh, Way to go, guys. We have lunch with the. Uh, us right now. Yes, we do. What a pretty fish. Or we'll even call it brunch. Five minutes into it. What a fishery. Pretty fish. Looking over this town of Antigua, surrounded by these giant volcanoes, 
There's such history on these streets. The corridors are set up in east, west, north, south. It's an amazing grid of, of, of buildings that has survived countless, countless lifetimes. Antigua reminded me of Europe, of Spain for sure. It had, you could absolutely see where it had that influence. Um, the architecture and the colors, it was vibrant and alive. The city was beautiful to walk around and every time you turn a corner there was a new beautiful sight to see, whether it was a fountain or a beautiful building or a mosaic and the streets were beautiful. So I, I absolutely loved Antigua. I could have spent days there myself. Uh, there's shopping and there's cafes and there's restaurants and it's full of life and people. It's, it's just an absolutely beautiful place to visit. It was the capital of Guatemala until it was destroyed by an earthquake and then rebuilt again, but the ruins remain. Seeing all this is, it makes you feel small. It really does. Standing at the foot of Fuego, you realize the power that Mother Nature has and how brittle life is to think that you could be standing there and a couple of minutes later be gone because this thing decides to erupt. And that's what happened several years ago. This thing just blew. And when it blew, it sent lava down the side of this mountain. It said over 200 miles an hour, just killing hundreds of people. And there's no telling when this thing's going. It spews out smoke every couple minutes and small eruptions and lava comes pouring out and you think, God, just don't let it happen today. But at the same time, you're just in amazement of the, the beauty of it. When you leave the port to head out sail fishing, you get a couple miles offshore and, and you turn around and you look. You see what's created this landscape. You see what has formed this land. It's just giant volcanoes that over time have created Guatemala as we know it today. He doesn't even know he's hooked. Yeah. He's coming right at us. Watch this, guys. He's right here. He's right here on a transom. I think we were probably had to spread out for less than three minutes. And you're catching beautiful big mahi. I mean, you travel, I travel in the Bahamas to try to catch fish like this and catch a handful a year. And these, these things are like, flies buzzing around you. It's crazy. They, you know, they want to catch one or two for, for lunch. And after that, they want, they want billfish. But I'm just as happy catching these mahi. They're so colorful. They're so acrobatic. They're, they're such good fighters. They're, I don't think there's a prettier fish in, in the sea than these, these mahi. So to have the ability to catch 30, 40 pound mahi, I'm tickled to death. Dang, I got a mahi fight like this. <laughs> They know they're going to become a sashimi. He doesn't want to become a lunch. That's right. yeah. They're just as mean as the sailfish here. Oh. Oh, that's nice. Just off awesome color. Another good sized one. Yep, there he is. God, this is another good one. Oh, good. Look at the oh, color of that one. Beautiful. Catching dolphin is nothing new to Heather and I, but the quality of fish, the number of fish, this is a different experience. We'd be happy to catch one of these fish in a season. Oh. Woo, man, you have a fishery here. This is Ten just great. And we have breakfast and lunch. Yeah. So fish tacos for lunch, guys? Yeah. Woo! So, known for your billfish, but oh. incredible mahi fishery as well. It is, it is. Clients love getting mahi early morning so they can enjoy a good ceviche afterwards. It's a big staple of uh, what you serve, it's, even at, back at the resort. You know, we had it yesterday when we got here. Can't get a, any fresher than this. That's why we love it. Yeah. yeah. So there's plenty of those around here. You also get yellowfin, blue marlin. Yep. So, a good variety of species. I mean, we are fishing 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 
and both those trophy-sized bulldogs. Adam? Yep. Woo-hoo! So we're sitting here in January. When is the prime time? From October till uh, May. It can be any day. According to Miami University statistics, there's no difference between any month. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Ends up being a matter of angler's luck. <laughs> we're known for the terrific selfish bite Guatemala has. Numbers will average around 20 bites per day per boat. That's what makes Guatemala such an interesting fishery. And the science behind it is just quite simple. Our underwater topography is just perfect to harvest bait. I think what I love most about Pacific Sailfish is their aggression. With that size comes power, and they, they show that power in their jumps. You first hook that fish, he's going nuts back there. The captain's turning, making the turn. You're trying to you know, keep the belly of the line out, and you want to keep that fish on the surface. You don't want him to go down. You want him to stay up. You want him to jump, exert himself, tire himself out. This fish is lit up, has everything to offer in one fish. There's not many fish in the ocean that match the energy of the Pacific sailfish. The oxygen level below 100 feet of water here is very low. They've determined that. They've done research and they figured that out. And what that does is that concentrates all the bait and the predator fish at the top of the water column, putting them within range of your spread of bait. So you from the Ministries of Fishery, how are you involved, per se, with this market itself? You said you know people here. Yeah, mostly what we are working now, it's with the support of the sport fishing sector here, the private sector, is making projects to make the weight of the trade fish and how can they handle, uh, how they can make ice, and how can they sell better the fish to the markets. The longliners, they go out for multiple days. The common time is for three days, two nights, and they don't have any kind of communication with the land. So normally they only tell the people that they are going to fish, and if for three days they don't come back, something happens for them. And how far uh, out will they typically go? Like 100 miles. 100 miles? Nautical miles. In Panga. Yeah. Uncovered? And, yeah. They don't and have do they have any idea what weather's coming? Do they really? No, no. We don't have that kind of a forecast here. <laughs> And the fisherman, it, uh, that boat, it's um, 700 hooks and three miles, three the, miles. The, the, the whole length of the long line. What do they bait it with? A squid and ballyhoo. Our, our main job for the fisheries department here in Guatemala now is changed not only for the resource, but mostly working with the fishermen, knowing about if they don't manage well the resource in a period of time, they will not catch any kind of fish. The, the fish is not affected by their own, it's, it's affected by, by people. And you need to change the, the ways of the people to keep the resource well. 
So we need to have some balance, and, and for now, for sure, what we need is to work better with, uh, with the people here. For nearly 25 years, Blackfin has been producing the highest quality, American-made, handcrafted fishing rods in the industry. Whether you're targeting inshore species such as snook, trout, reds, or tarpon, or big game pelagics like tuna, marlin, sailfish, or swordfish, Blackfin has the rods to suit your needs. Blackfin is located in my hometown, and I've visited the factory numerous times. I can attest to the passion that the skilled craftsmen and artisan put into each one of the Blackfin rods. It's because of the high quality and durability I choose Blackfin. Check them out at a retailer nearest you. There are days that you will see selfish being very sluggish. That's just because they're just so full. They've been eating all day, all night. And uh, when they see a ballyhoo, a teaser, being pulled by our boats, they might not be that interesting. But then again, there are here in such large amounts that you will always catch selfish. This is the perfect destination to learn because you know that if you miss there will be a next one coming along very soon that's what makes guatemala either a beginner destination or an avid angler destination you know you could come down here with a little bit of knowledge a little bit of uh, tutorial you can figure this out pretty quick and that's what's great when you come to an area like this you're not just getting one shot a day you're getting multiple shots so you may mess up the first one, or the second one, or the third one, but there's going to be additional shots, and you can continue to learn as you're getting those shots. What did I do wrong? Did I drop back long enough? Did I raise the rod tip? Drop the rod tip? You know, did I really? There's so many opportunities that you're not discouraged by missing one fish because soon after you know another bite is coming. He's right here on the surface. Here he comes. Niels is the owner of Pacific Fins, and out of all his businesses, I think this is the one he's most passionate about. When you talk to this guy, you can see it in his eyes, you can hear it in his voice. He has a true love of, of sailfish and the billfish, and he has a desire to do everything to protect these fish. The beauty is that in the last five years, our conservation efforts have been met with high regards, both within the Guatemalan government as well as within the artisan fishermen, they now clearly understand that sport fishing is a viable economic option for the country. It is a tourist alternative that should become one of the largest sources of income for the region and for the country. And that is just what showcases that what we do in conservation can actually yield economic results. Around every turn is something special on trips like this. Ozzie and Neil set up this whole to call trip. We had talked about it previously about going to call, 
and it was quite the excursion. But to have the ability to have a local there with local knowledge and to share not only the experience of Tikal, but the journey of getting there, the small villages. One of the stops along the way, that the guide said, we have to stop at this little place. You know, they, you know, they make local artisans making local crafts. In the back, they have these treats that are growing. These things look like giant nuts. And, and the lady says to us, these are cocoa. This is cocoa. This is how they make chocolate. You can eat this? No, because this is unripe. So if it was okay. ripe, you could... Yeah, you can. When, when it is ripe, you have to put it in the sun first. Okay. Then try you can yeah, try it out, then you can, you can eat it. The homeowner just brought us, brought us this. This is the finished product. Right this here. is the, pro the finished pr uh, process. Right. These have been dried. Oh, yeah. You can eat these. Mm, you can. <laughs> you should have asked first. <laughs> <laughs> I just ate a seed out of a tree. It tastes like a candy bar. Cushy? I'm good. I almost got him. Ready? Oh, 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 oh.